Welcome to Become Famous Podcast, the ultimate destination for achieving fame in your industry. Join us for discussions as we uncover the strategies and secrets to becoming known, navigating cancel culture, and staying authentic. Stay tuned because here at Become Famous, the journey to fame begins now. Welcome to Become Famous uh, podcast. I'm so excited to have Eden Gordon, who is a longtime friend of mine, who has been like we talked last week about Eric Loxmo, branched out, really created an influence for herself. But also what I think is more important, she understands what I'm talking about in my book, The Fame Revolution, about how we all need to somewhat, in a sense, embrace being a public figure, embrace the limelight of social media to really make a mark on what you're doing in your business. So welcome, Eden. How are you? Oh, thank you, Torin. It's so great to be here. I'm excited. Congratulations on this amazing podcast. Well, thank you and, and your journey. So really want to learn more about you. Uh, you've really had an amazing political life, career life. You've uh, branched out and done things in, not in a traditional way. Um, mm-hmm. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit about it because we met in Congress. You mm-hmm. worked for the leadership in the Senate and I worked for Senator Hatch. And mm-hmm. I don't even remember how we connected, but we did connect somehow, some, all the circles that we were in yeah. and we forged a really fun relationship and yes. friendship. And so I would love for people to learn about your, your journey. Oh, wow. Well, <laughs> let me grab a cup of coffee as we're uh, getting ready to celebrate <laughs> National Coffee Day. Um, well, it's National so Coffee Day. National Coffee Day is Sunday, the 29th okay. of September. Okay. So um, depending on when this airs, well, happy National Coffee Day every day to me. I'm like a Gilmore girl. Just give me an IV. So we're rocking and rolling. Um, so thank you. <laughs> no, seriously, I'm not joking. My husband's very concerned about my coffee addiction. Anyway, I am. Um, I'm glad to be here. And it's it's fun to talk about the journey that God has placed me on. And for all of those who are graduating from university, for all of those who are in high school or in, even in a transition in a season of life, if you are really searching for what's next, you know, you could plan, you could plan your journey, but God really does ordain your steps. And I would never in a million years have realized, you know, saying, oh, I was going to go there and then there and then there. So, you know, going from Capitol Hill to White House to Fox Business to starting my own business, you know, doing um, doing school here and going online there and then running for state house and then being a veteran spouse and now re- running a radio show for books and authors and talent. OK, wow. OK, God, thank you. I am you know, I have to stand back and I'm very humbled to the journey that he has given me steps of faith. And there's been so much of, you know, it wasn't easy. It was constantly getting back up because people, as you know, in the DC beltway and in the Hollywood world, they were, they will be the first ones to stab you in the back. And depending if you're from New York or from the blessed South, you know, one way or the other, it's going to happen. And you still and my my lesson is you still get back up your legs and your knees may be scraped you may be bu- bruised all over but you get back up especially being a person of faith that boldness being brave knowing that god has called you for such a time as this whether it was in the early 2000s right after 911 or whether it's now as we watch this election unfold and the very canvas of the American uh, American history, American life change one way or the other, but you get back up. You don't stop fighting. And I think people have become so complacent mm. to not want to fight. Well, they're going to do it anyway. So that's my mentality. It's fighting. It's that Esther. It's that Esther mentality. And so for people that aren't religious, Esther was in in the Bible and she was a queen that had a lot of trials and it was her faith that really brought her to become queen and not to be executed, not have her people executed, the the Jewish people. So uh, I love, yes, I think you're really right about, and I think this is probably one of the hardest things for me to actually have been through is the stabbing in the back of people that you work with in the entertainment industry and politics and 
having to, as Bob Dole says, don't, I don't remember what the quote is, but it's like, don't, don't look for friends. Uh, get it. If you're looking for friends, get a dog. Get a dog. <laughs> Yes, exactly. <laughs> and and I and I'm and I remember that, you know, when I was in politics and remembering how you lose one election, you lose everything, and then if you win, you win everything, right? It's it was amazing the difference between Bob Dole and Bush and yeah. you know the the losses and the wins and um but when you look at it, you how did you start? Because I think um, yes, we have to have the fighter attitude, and I think you do need that more so in politics. But I think today, that attitude in life that we grew up in politics, you grew up in politics, I grew up in politics, that's yeah. kind of what we learned how to do our craft. Right. Don't you think that some of that is trickling into the regular public right now because people do need to be looking at themselves as a politician. I don't think people want to think of themselves as a politician, but I try to provoke them to it. And I, I'm a little bit nicer. I say public figure, but need to look at yourself more seriously, take yourself more seriously mm -hmm. as entering to the, into the public, which is the social media, because you can go viral in an instant you can um, be canceled in an instant. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, let me go back to your initial thought of how did how did we enter into this? How did this happen? And you know, I entered into the political climate when I was thirteen years old. Thirteen? I didn't even know that. Yeah, my wow. father. My father was in state and local Pennsylvania politics, and. I was at campaign headquarters. I was at GOP headquarters counting votes. This is the way it really should be, right? Yeah, yeah. totally agree. And um, so that's where it really started for me. So he had me going to political events, meeting Arlen Specter and, and all the great, you know, the old guard of Pennsylvania. I'm talking old guard 80s and early 90s. And, you know, I was meeting these people and it was just, it was it was a no brainer for me. As soon as I went to university in DC over by uh, American university, it's an all girls school. I said, I'm not waiting till my senior year to become an intern on Capitol Hill. I'm going straight up there. I'm not waiting. Like, why do I have to wait? What's the reason behind that? Right. And I interned my freshman year of college with uh, Congressman Joe Pitts, who is now retired. And that's where everything started for me. And it was the business of relationships, the building. Oh, stop there. I am. I. I think that is a great phrase. That's the best phrase. The business of relationships, and I'm gonna. I'm gonna use that because I have not known how to express it, but there is a business in relationship. There really is. Please continue. That is that. Thank you. That is really good. Well, I, you know, I sit here now as I run my business of relationships, my LLC running, doing strategic communications for authors and faith-based organizations and campaigns and you name it. And I always cite those relationships that started from the very beginning for me that I can still source and go to if I find a client would be an ideal opportunity for them. And it is building those bridges. And I think our university students today have no idea how to have those relationships. They're getting the book knowledge when, and a lot of those, that book knowledge isn't necessarily for good. Hmm. And they're also sitting and looking at their phones, having a relationship with the text versus having a relationship with someone in front of you. So when they go in for interviews, they struggle. When they are looking for that six-figure job straight out of UNC Chapel Hill, they're not going to get that. I had a student say to me, oh, yeah, six figures ready for me as soon as I graduate Chapel Hill. I said, sister, do you know how to make coffee? Because you're going to need to learn how to make coffee before you even get those zeros after that salary number. And I said, you have got to know how to handle relationships, how to cultivate relationships don't be so quick to burn. I had a reporter say to me, Young, I've been burning bridges and my reputation is now people knowing that I'm burning bridges. And I said, what are you going to do about it? I said, I'll forgive you 70 times seven because I believe in you. 
but you got to stop burning those bridges because your reputation is now known as that. Isn't this so interesting? Because I think what you learn in politics and the business of relationship is really that the highest value is not the money that you get, but the highest value is your reputation. And I've always been very careful about uh, what I do, what I say. I um, I don't know if you remember this when we were in Capitol Hill, and this really changed my whole way of communicating online, was mm-hmm. the guy that had that dating story that he put on an email, like really flat, really, really, uh, this is like 2000. Um, he uh, wrote this thing about his date, which went viral on Capitol Hill. And within- I don't remember that. Within, I and it, was on, it was on one cat, the blog of one cat, right? And I remember this. This was, this was right in the middle of the campaign. So it would be hard for probably you to remember. You have we had the Bush campaign, all this kinds yeah. of stuff going on. And right. at the same time, we're on in the Senate, working with the bills and so forth. But I, it froze me to the core because this guy, I don't even remember his name. And he's probably grateful I don't know his name. But he had sent an email to his friend on Capitol Hill just like, you know, just talking, you know, crap, what they usually do. Like you're just water cooler chat. Yeah. Oh, right? absolutely. And he put the water cooler chat in an email, right? And this guy <laughs> forwarded to one person. And within 24 hours, it went on Wonkette. Wonkette was the big blog that we always read, right? And she was like the she was like the um, gossip girl of, of Capitol Hill, right? Yeah. And it went with her. And then it went to the local NPR, all the news, Washington Post. <laughs> and within 48 hours, he was fired and he couldn't get a job in D.C. Wow. That stuck with me. Oh, of course. That totally stuck with me. So I've never, ever written anything in an email up until this today that cannot go in front of a newspaper. Right. Absolutely. And the same thing now, like, let's take that lesson and use it in text messaging as well. Yeah. Use it in whatever whatever copy that you are writing, whether it's just a personal note or if it is a simple email or something in those lines that somebody would not share and would not pick up and want to use to damage or enhance you, whatever it is. But always keep that in mind, no matter what industry you're in. But I think you and I, I was always impressed with you and your relationships. Like you had such a deference on understanding the finesse reading the room and i remember when we were working on the whole issue with uh mel gibson the passion of christ then we worked on uh the whole bono with Mm -hmm. aids and all that stuff in the middle and you just knew how to move in those circles and it seems to me that you learned a lot of it just from observing your dad and knowing the unwritten rules that you're not really taught, but when you're on Capitol Hill, you're taught it by observation. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I um, I always remember saying to um, my church community that was such a big part of my life. So during that 9-11 time period, you know, the nation really came together. And it was in that same time period that I was working for Senate leadership. And it was in that same time period, Mel Gibson movie and the Bono AIDS to Africa movement and just this holy whole Hollywood and Washington DC come together movement of you know enriching the culture, the good, the true, and the beautiful. And I always remember saying to friends in that space, because they're always, hey, Bono's here, can you know, we want to see him. And I said, just remember, he gets dressed the same way we do in the morning. He does the same thing we do to get ready for the day. And to not hold these people in higher regard than what they are. Yes, they may be these visionaries. They may be these musical leaders. They may be be these famous entrepreneurs, but they're still just like you and me. And fast forward to today, I have found more than ever as we are in the fight of our lives with this campaign, whether which side you are on, we are not electing a pastor. We are electing a president of the United States. And so many people in whatever faith movement that you are, whether it's the Catholic Church, evangelical Protestants across the board, they're so caught up with wanting a pastor as president. Oh, really? Yes. I didn't realize that. Yes. And that has that has been quite the split. Well, it's like Drew Barrymore. She's looking for a mama in the president. 
Mm -hmm. Mama Kamala Harris. I was like, I don't want a mother. I want, I, if I'm going to have a woman, I want her to be closer to Margaret Thatcher to be tough and be yeah. able to say no to these people. And I don't want a mama. But the and point I don't want is, a pastor. <laughs> but the th point is, we have got to stop idolizing whatever, whether it's right. pop culture, whether it's politicians, whether it is, you know, our, our spouses, whatever. The idolization piece is going to destroy us. And if we are that empty inside searching for something that cannot fill us, it's going to be temporal. We got a bigger issue. And I see that around the nation. You know, you talk about becoming famous and becoming and walking, you know, just even going to the supermarket and your brand. You talk about your the brand and the power of the brand. And it is how we treat people, good or bad, which really is our brand. That is both in the personal segment and both in the professional segment. So first impressions and becoming famous is everything. And there is somebody who's running for governor from a state that I'm very familiar with. And bad things have come out in these last days of the election. I had met this person a couple of years ago when I was running. And, they're for, and somebody asked me in the state, what was your impression? What do you think? I said, first impressions are everything. And I'm telling myself this. I'm not, I'm not perfect either. But first impressions make a big impact. I learned that from my mother-in-law, and I've learned that in my career. And that first impression that candidate gave me was not a good one. Oh, and, yeah. it's, and it has stuck with me ever since. Wow, yeah. And so when people ask me, I give the full honest opinion. But my point in saying that is, to your audience, to those who are in middle season of their career or just starting out or even just needing a refresh or just starting a new career at 50, that first impression could make or break an opportunity, especially if that's the opportunity you want. Being available, being available virtually, depending on the world that we live in, being available to have those conversations. Daily, I get people calling me, hey, can you talk? And these are big names. I just need to talk. People know that they can call me and just talk. We end up praying together because that is what people, people are yearning for something greater. They're yearning for something more. And they are, they're searching for a foundation that a lot of people don't have right now. And it goes back to putting their hopes in temporal things. Yeah. And I think what's so interesting when you say that is that people, um, uh, they really are looking when they're thinking about the fame when i talk about the fame thing and a lot of people say to me i don't like the fame thing and and i think there is the reason why they don't like it is because they don't like the emptiness because mm -hmm. fame can't promise you anything it's just a vehicle for you to show what's in your heart right, right. A vehicle for you to become known like if you have a business right now mom and pop you can't just stay uh, on the on the main street without having an Instagram, right? You can't. St you have to look at yourself as your marketplace is no longer just Main Street. It is the world, right? Eighty six percent of the world has a smartphone. We're competing with AI, but we are also friends with AI, right? So you're in yeah. this, and everyone has a mobile phone, like smartphone, like eighty six percent. Everyone yeah. can be a spokesperson for something, right? And so uh, I think you're so right because people get clashed with my message. They get really pissed with it. And yet it's not about the message of becoming famous. It's really what you're saying. It's the emptiness that they need to fill that fame can never fill, but it is a vehicle for whatever your desire and what your mission is. Yeah, I, I, I find myself and I sit there and just chuckle you know, you have all the social media accounts and with my radio show at WMAL, I sit there and I put out weekly messages. We do weekly YouTube videos. We do the podcast. We do live to air. We do all these things with big influencers and then small names and new authors and all the in between. And you think you got it. And then you realize, oh no, you still don't got it. There's more to it. And finding yourself falling into a trap of Oh, they didn't like that? They should have liked that. <laughs> or falling into a trap of, well, wait a second. You know, this should have had more clickbaits than it is. And I, I come back and say to myself, what is your real purpose in doing this, Eden? What's your real purpose? So for all of the audience out there, what is your true purpose in doing what you are doing? And I realize what my main purpose is, 
is out of faith. If just one person hears an interview that I do, because my show is all about faith, God, country, and family, and they're not going to walk away from the show not knowing what faith is about. But if just one person hears it, I did my job that day. And that is countering the culture where you have to have 100,000 views and you're something. And that's how I look at it. And you know, when God decides to do something different with my show or do something different with me, those again, go back to the journey that you and I talked about. I may plan my steps, but I may plan my journey, but he ordains the steps. So taking you back to DC, because you were at, you were at a very high level at a very young age. Um, and I remember you, we had some really fun times where we were taking <laughs> areas and we said, Hey, we are the future of the party. So you better have, you better have dinner with us. Can you believe us doing that? <laughs> I do. I do. We had, some we, of the people actually said yes. It was such a delight. But you really <laughs> had you had such a voice at such a young age, and you um, saw the highs very young. Mm-hmm. And um, how did you how did you manage that? So you got an internship. You went to Pitts. Then you went to the Senate leadership, um, and you were. And then you had all the Bono, the Mel Gibson. You were really at the center of the storm. I would say of Hollywood coming together with DC and you were in the middle of all of it. And how did you manage that? And then eventually some kind of a challenge that you had in that space. How did you deal with it? I, 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 I'm very, you know, I go back to, you know, I always, I didn't run in your normal Capitol Hill circles. I didn't go to the bars. I didn't go out after work. My focus was, it was faith. It was God. It was going to Bible study. It was surrounding myself with a group of community people at my church. It was being a part of that, that centered me, that gave me my foundation. And a lot of those people in that church are still friends, lifelong friends today, 20, 25 years later. It's crazy to even think about that's been almost, it's been that long. (laughs) I know. And I, but that was what kept me grounded. And, you know, having been raised in a home of faith that kept me grounded and my my desire my my zeal my excitement for wanting to serve a selfless serve not a selfish serve that we see today that was there too that still is there and i always say that the selfish serve versus the self shit selfish serve is what i see you know i want to say something really quickly and we'll go back to that time period but being a veteran spouse and being in a military community and being surrounded by Fort Bragg and Seymour Johnson and Camp Lejeune and New New River and, and Cherry Point and all the powerhouses of this nation has to offer here in this state, we have the lowest recruiting level since before World War II in our nation. And it goes back to that whole famous thing. And it goes back to what are we doing in today's society that is leading to this? Is it a certain leader? Is it a certain way of thinking? Is it a, you know, the worldview of what's coming from, you know, the White House and Capitol Hill? But I I go back to the phone. I go back to the 86% that you said on the smartphone aspect. We are a very selfish country. And that selfless service that I knew in my grandfathers, that I knew in my father-in-law, who both served in World War II and Vietnam, that I saw in my husband during 9-11 in Iraq. That's selfless service. And this generation is lacking that. It is a selfish how many people are now following me on TikTok versus being on the front lines, wanting to fight for our freedoms. That is something we need to be focused on more than ever. Our country, the public square, where we sit today and what is happening in our future generations these future generations know nothing about 9-11 and you and I lived it. Oh, isn't that it's so interesting? Cause both you and I were in the middle. I was actually the closest civilian to the Pentagon. Yeah. And, yeah. and, uh, and I was so afraid cause I thought my boyfriend had died, which was really, tra- it was like, it's such a crazy moment yeah. for the city. Yeah. You died in the flames and I was just sitting there looking at it. Um, and so I totally, I totally resonate with that. But um 
And at the same time, if we go back to you, because I think we can learn something from your life, because I think you've you've seen the highest levels of things and and then managing the stabbing in the back and managing the business of relationships. How um how did you handle that? I mean, I think it's it's I think it's um and I think you're right. My my I'm grounded in with my mother. My mother was very much into and I think living in a small town, you you understand the business of relationships more yeah. so city because you see the impact if you do one thing your reputation stays with you there's there's no right right right? um but how did you how did you do because you went from capitol hill then you went to uh if i recall you went uh, you went back to college i think it is and then you did fox did did bowery mission yeah i did new york for a long while went back to capitol hill and and then eventually um burnout burnout set in after being on campaign trails and things of that nature. And I retreated to North Carolina to just serve again, but in a different capacity, serving at the USO, serving at Camp Lejeune, serving our military spouses and our families. And that really kind of transformed my heart. It was that service part because you're not so inwardly focused that you um, lose sight of your purpose. And I think going back, going to present day, we are up against so much uncertainty in this culture and we're up against the next clickbait and we're up against, what do they think of me? Am I going to lose my job? All of those questions. I get people calling me all the time saying they, they've been laid off because of the economy and people tend to go inwards and isolate. And I think the isolation technique is a battle that a lot of people and the mental health is a battle that a lot of people are afraid to talk about, but it's happening and it's a reality. We're headed, I mean, mental health is at its highest levels. The Barna survey just came out earlier this week because the age groups that we are seeing that are dealing with it, it's across the board, but they don't have an understanding of what a worldview is and they're struggling with what they mean. And going back to my journey, it was that foundation of family. It was that foundation of faith. It was that what I call now my pit crew of having amazing women around me, lifting me up and never stopping to pray for me and being there, being that support system when the goings got tough, when the backstabbings happened when the mis- being un- misunderstood happened to losing jobs to being you know at the highest levels of government and then all of a sudden poof it's gone to that even- is what i would love for you to talk about because i think i think people don't realize in life you're going to be up and you're going to be down yeah how did you handle that because i remember that when it happened to me but i would love to hear how did you faith family and friends yes and i and your pit crew is what i like to call my book the kitchen cabinet yeah yeah how how did you how did you manage that because to have been at such a high level and then we all come down and then how did you how did you manage the dark years if we're going to put it that way yeah, the dark years were short, thankfully, but they were not easy. You know, asking friends for money to try and get to the next, what's next for me, God? Question, why did this happen, God? Depression. I don't think I had anxiety at that point. I do have anxiety now. Um, you know, I'm being very, um, you know, very vulnerable with your audience, but those are real things. You can't cover those things up and you've got to face them, whether it is being just being honest with yourself and saying, you know what? I got screwed. And the people I thought were closest to me just screwed me over. You got to forgive in order to move on. And that's a hard task because you trust and you trust. But I'll never forget one of my dearest friends from the Bush White House. We all went to church together. And he was so sweet. We would meet for coffee and we were talking about all of our initiatives, all of our work together. And he challenged me 
encouraged me and lifted me up from the friend standpoint and said, and this is biblical for your audience and it's scripture, but never throw your pearls before swine. And I use that today still with the people I represent, with the people I work with for the radio show, with the highest levels of leaders. We're all human. We're all going to fall. We all are born evil. But we all, I want to believe, want to do good and believe to see the good of the Lord in the land of the living. But we all are going to fail each other intentionally or unintentionally. And that forgiveness piece is key. If you don't forgive and you harbor, it's only hurting you. You're allowing that person to dominate and rent space, actually not rent space, but take up space in that brain of yours and that heart of yours when you should be allowing something better. I also say, if you have been, if it's poof, it's gone. I say to people and I say to myself, well, God has something better and he also is protecting me. And I am talking from experience. God protects, he provides, and he has something better. Could I have done something better? Absolutely. Am I learning from it? Absolutely. Am I forgiving? Me too. And absolutely. And sometimes that's hard, but you have to do it. What would you say is the criteria for how do you discover someone is a swine that you don't want to give the pearls to? What, do you have any kind of like mile markers or things that you're seeing right now? Yeah. Mind? What is your kind of like, is there a checklist that you kind yeah, of- Yeah, there's a, there's a gut checklist. Mm -hmm. It's a gut list, honestly. Women have such a great gut that they need to listen to. And I think a lot of the times, sometimes we don't listen to it because we want that thing so bad. But if something just is nagging at you and you can't quite figure it out, you need to listen to it. You need to tune into what could that be? I always have found that in the quiet moments of my day and the in-between is when I hear God's voice say to me, he gives me answers. He guides me. And it's in those moments that I have to listen to that. I need to listen to that over, oh, I want that so bad. But why? No, oh, I know. It's so so easy to, I think you're so right. I remember this one job I took and I knew in my gut not to take it, but I was so fearful of not having a job, right? So you, you're making uh, a choice and it was the biggest disaster of a choice hated the job. It was the worst job. And then I was stuck in the job for a while. And I was like, wow, listening to the gut is mm -hmm. really, really key. It is and very, yeah. That, well, that Like now I listen more to my gut than ever. Even if I don't, even if I, my whole brain, my body, I, was, I don't know why, why is, it, why is my gut saying this? I do not disobey that gut feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's, the, it's the gut and it's that first impression. Mm -hmm. So if you are being asked to consider a role or you are asked to be considered for a role, as much as they are interviewing you for that role, you're interviewing them. Mm -hmm. And I have found that with running my business, when people want to be potential clients and come to me and meet with me and meet with me again, I'm interviewing them too, because I want to know the personalities I'm going to be working with or not working with. And it's for your audience to keep in mind, it's that gut check, that first impression, how they handle situations. Also looking into how they've interacted with other people before. What's their record? Is it, I know when I ran for state house, the other candidate, the, um, who was running against me, female, military spouse. Everybody claimed that we were exactly alike. The only thing that was exactly alike was our husbands both served and that was it. Not policy-wise, not service-wise, nothing. But the people that ended up supporting this candidate said, well, well, look at Eden's record. All you see is a government service worker who just climbed the ladder and jumped from one job to another. Well, that's correct. You got that right, but you didn't get the service part right. You didn't look at the policies I worked on, and you certainly didn't look at the people I represented. And I take that to heart when I am talking to people, whether they are looking for advice for their next role, looking at just understanding the backgrounds of people. Because at the very end of the day, when people are struggling, they're going to lash out at those that they are closest to. 
And you have got to keep that in mind. But I also put this out there for the the faith audience that is listening in. Just be guarded on those who are trying to portray a faith, but in actuality, they just want to come and destroy because they are out there. There are people out there like that. And I have had to deal with them in my business. So interesting that you say that um, jumping around uh, and climbing the ladder. Yeah. I, would, I, would, I would not... I just, I, and, and that's interesting because that's the last thing I would, I would think of you. Uh, isn't that interesting? That's the last thing I would absolutely think of you uh, in my life, observing you from the sidelines. We left DC. We had a short uh, connection when you were in New York and I left for Norway, but I've never, and then when you got married, it was so fun to see all the beautiful, <laughs> and wonderful guy that you married and just seeing you from the sidelines. And that's why I love Facebook because it really still connected me with my life in the US. Mm-hmm. That is the last thing mm-hmm. I would ever, ever think of you. And and it's just so fascinating that that is what people held on to, certain people of the- During the campaign. Yeah, yeah. that's really, that's mm-hmm. really surprising to me. But here's, here's the other side of- being in public office or running for public office and public service, you can't let the low life scum <laughs> destroy you and your family. And they sought to destroy my husband's military career. They sought to destroy my service to this nation. And wow. I sat there and thought, well, it will. You know, this is Old Testament, but. God's vindication is much bigger than whatever I could do. But how did you deal with that? Like, so, because you've really been really at the throes of, of cancel culture mm-hmm. in, in the sense of uh, you, you put yourself out there, you ran for office, you weren't just behind the scenes. Uh, mm-hmm. How did you, how did you manage that? A couple different ways. Um, running for public office, you are, you have to put all cards on the table, can be, be completely vulnerable. And your, you know, your spouse, your family is going to go through that as well. And how I mentally handled it and spiritually handled it was I knew God was calling me to do that, whether I won or lost. And I did lose. It was a stolen election. I, I kind of went through what Trump went through. It was a stolen election. The candidate paid the Tea Party and the rest is history. I wasn't going to pay. I wasn't going to throw my pearls like that. Mm. And a lot of people challenged it. But my point in saying that is not going into the weeds of the campaign itself, but I the experience overall was meeting great people, but it was also uncovering tactics in the local government that had been covered up for a long time that nobody was talking about. It was uncovering issues in the school system. It was uncovering things that should have been taken care of for our veterans. Example, a veteran center in the local area had closed and did not notify any of the veterans. And you go to your highest levels of government because that is federal, deny, deny, deny. Well, we didn't, you know, we told everybody. Well, no, you didn't. But my point in saying that is I walked through it, I ran through it, knees scraped, blood, sweat, and tears, the abuses of the other side, knowing where I stood knowing that whose I was and knowing what else God would have in store for me. And on the other side, looking on the other side, I've never been stronger in speaking out the truth, knowing that cancel culture, censorship is happening right around the corner. And I've never stopped being brave or being bold about that, just standing up for who, what I believe in, who I believe in, standing up for and advocating for our veterans advocating for our future generations, making sure that they're not going to be destroyed by these awful, insidious attacks on their body, the mental health issues. I just continue to fight for that, but I get to do it behind the microphone and I get to do it on a station that carries my voice. I get to do it daily in the public square with representing my amazing clients and I don't stop doing it. And it's give it, it really gave me a greater strength than I didn't realize I had after coming on the other side of that. Wow. And you, you've you also worked for Fox. And uh, <laughs> have you had uh, the role of the media as close that you had and yeah. being in a lot of Roger Ailes's 
yeah. of of the um, of Fox. What what is your did it change your perspective on how to present ourselves into the media? Did it change? Is there some advice you have for people? As I say, you need to become famous for what you do. It doesn't mean you have to have the media attention of the television stations, but I do believe that people that are in television have much more acute sense of the sound bites, the yeah. way to yourself, way to create yeah. the information. What did you learn from that that you could share with the listeners? A couple things from the Fox News perspective, but also what I share with my clients today. Um, in regards to how they need to present themselves. You know, looks are everything. You know, you can even go back to Kennedy and Nixon debates. Looks are everything. And seeing the different anchors at Fox News, how they presented themselves, what they went through behind the scenes, but what they looked like on the news station and how they presented themselves. Other things I say to my clients, short and sweet and to the point, with your sound bites, but make them with a power punch. Don't just try and get your your five minutes of fame on Fox News. It's great. It's just going to last for a few minutes, though. What you want is not just those five minutes, but a recurring relationship. It goes back to the business and relationships, even from the media standpoint. So for the audience who's tuning in and they want to be on TV, they want to be on the radio, they want to have digital media, they want to have op-eds in the newspapers... Your relationships with those people on the other side of that desk is going to go a lot longer and a lot farther if you build those relationships and you care, you take care of those relationships. Yes, they are media and they're going to get what they want, but a lot of them are genuinely decent people who are just doing a job. And you've got to remember that they are also a mom, a dad, and they're also dealing with their own stuff. And the industry is consistently changing. It's nonstop. It's a turnaround overnight during the first attempted Trump assassination and then the second. It's like, what's going to happen next weekend? The media is nonstop now. And there's a certain balance that you need to keep if you are looking to be on the news cycle. Give yourself that downtime. My friend at one of the radio shows has inspired me in all the years of being on the radio. And he says, he and his wife, they just shut off everything on the weekend, have time with the family, have the downtime. So they can fill their cup back up and be able to serve the public. So if there are people on here who are wanting to serve the public, you need to have that downtime so then you can be on and you can have powerful segments in the news cycle. You can make a greater impact when you are well rested, your cup is filled and your mind is clear. And those things I think people forget. Um, That was... The best description I've ever heard about about how to interact with media, and I, I I totally agree with you. And I have a hard time with it. How do you handle the person that just wants to rush? Mm-hmm. How do you mm-hmm. to get to teach them? Mm-hmm. There's a mess. I think what's being lost in this world right now it's so focused on marketing. Yes, and mar- marketing is not about relationships. Marketing is about getting the client and selling it. Communication is much more the finesse of the relationship and having those two together right now is what I think. And what we did in politics is what's paramount that is missing a lot of places. And how do you educate people that are so in the marketing hamster wheel, right. need this, 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 and not stepping in the step back is yeah. what is my reputation? Yeah. What's my relationships? Yep. And how do you, how do you educate your new clients on that? Because that, that's something yeah. I'm challenged with. Well, I, it, it is a challenge. It is a challenge because they are seeing one thing and you're telling them the complete opposite. So, yeah. So a lot of the times I sit there and talk to these clients, either face-to-face like you and I are doing right now, or I have phone conversations with them. I've found that texting can be great, but texting can also misconstrue a message. And I've had to say to clients, all right, let's pick up the phone. Let's talk. Let me educate you on what you're seeing and what I'm telling you. And let's meet here in the middle so you can understand. So it is, they need to be educated, whether they want to believe it or not, they need to be educated. So they've hired us to do a job. We need to teach them. We need to guide them along and we need to help them understand. Now, if they are not teachable, that's a problem. And and it's hard for people who've been oh, I've been doing it like this all these years. Why can't I do it 
now? Why can't I do it the same way? Well, here's why. And, you know, there are a lot of people that I represent who've done media for years. And the, like I said, it's changing. Every day it's changing and trying to keep up with it. But I'm going to go back to this one specific point. I am so thankful for my director at my show. He's taught me a lot. He's probably 10, 15 years younger than me. And he said, you know, Eden, we can do marketing all day. Meta is so in control of Facebook, Instagram, and everything else. And all they want you to do is buy ads. So it looks like you know, you're getting coverage on, you know, the the clickbaits and everything you're posting. But he said at the end of the day, it really goes back to what you do with your business, the traditional PR. People still want those relationships. People still want to be seen and heard and interact. You know, you have all these conferences, you know, we have what, 10, 15 conferences coming up in 2025 that your clients, my clients could participate in. That's where they're going to get their followers on social media, not necessarily the ad aspect. And I've had to have that conversation recently within the past two days saying marketing marries with PR that equals a great product, but not by itself. Yeah, I'm so glad that, you know, it's a breath of fresh air to talk with someone like you because you you get kind of alone in it. And then you're thinking to yourself, am I doing the right thing? Because I had to put my foot down uh, the other day. Yeah. This is the way it goes, or I'm not your consultant, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and, um, and I realized I hadn't educated enough, and I was like, "Wow!" So I'm gonna. I, I sat and I apologized. And I said, "Let's let's let's take a time out and let me uh, let me figure out a way to educate." You. Because what I realized is, uh, and what someone told me is that you're you all know all of it here, but you got to make sure people are understanding what. What mm-hmm. it is you talking about? Because I don't think people really understand the business of relationships. I, yeah. taught, I think the and only thing she really taught that is in Hollywood and DC. And I think that's their, that's their, that's their under finesse. Yeah. Well, there's one other thing I want to say to you and to those who have businesses, who are entrepreneurs, who are in this space. It's okay to fire clients. I have. I've it's hired. okay to fire clients. Yeah, it is. Because... We have boundaries in our business. We, one, need to make money. We, two, don't do anything for free. We, three, are not going to be harassed, manipulated, et cetera, in our businesses. We don't have time for it. And I have had to fire clients. You disrespect me once, okay? Disrespect me twice, not okay. Three times, I'm the fool, not doing it. And I would rather have my peace of mind. I work from home, so I have to keep boundaries up. And for all of those who work from home, boundaries are important. You don't want your work life carrying over into your personal and family life because that could hurt it and you don't want that. So having those powerful boundaries and not compromising with a client on where they want to go, what they want to do, making sure that they clearly understand. And at the end of the day, if they just don't get it, you got to let them go because it's not. And the thing is your reputation, it goes back to this business and relationships, your reputation. People in DC know me as Eden Gordon, not Eden Gordon Hill. I've only had Hill for seven years. And I sit there and say, they know my reputation and that client could hurt your reputation for as hard as you've worked for it. Wow. Yes, I totally agree. I want to ask you this really quickly. This comes from my book and it's kind of, I would love to spot check with you that that you feel like the uh and please be honest with me if you agree or not great um i believe as we are public figures we are products and people and i think this is where the experience of dc and hollywood and i'd love your insight on if if you agree but i say that today your product is you Mm -hmm. also the person and i think that is the biggest chasm for a regular person that's a business owner to understand you're also the product. Yeah. Eve, when we were in politics, that was our superpower as opposed to leaving and going into corporate world is we understood that component. I don't know if you agree with that. Well, I mean, we are a product. I mean, I sit here and chuckle. People know my me for mostly with me wearing my headbands, my big glasses, and my cup of coffee. I mean, that's my brand. That's my product. But they also know me for my energy, my positive light that I bring, the the truth I bring. And it's like you said the other day, like I mentioned to you, the other day, 
I had somebody call me and say, well, what do you think about this election? You're always a ray of light and you're always so hopeful. And so that's my product. That's my brand. And I think they were kind of caught off guard that I wasn't necessarily not hopeful, but I was very truthful in my perception and my perspective of what could happen to our country either way. And they were taken aback by that. But it goes back to the brand. People know me for the certain way that I look and what I talk about and my perspective on and my outlook and my hope. And I'm thankful for that because I've worked hard for that. But I thought of you as Jackie Kennedy. <laughs> You always dress so beautiful when you're on the hill with your pearls and with your <laughs> suits. And I was like, oh man, she looks so good. <laughs> oh man, yeah. I, you know, I, I idolized her and collected things on her for years and anything that had to do with Jackie Kennedy Onassis, right there. Yeah. You did that. Well, I think we're going to be coming to close. I could talk to you forever and a day. Um, but what I would love to see that I like to ask people at the end, and I actually love when you said the selfish purpose and the selfless purpose, mm -hmm. because I think some people that are very much people pleasers or want to please yeah. society, they go straight to a selfless component. But I, I like the analogy of at the airport at the, or when you're on a plane, you have, when it's emergency, you got to put your mask on first for oxygen. Then you put the other person. So there is a component that you need to be selfish. So what I say to people, what do you want to be known selfishly? And what do you want to be known selflessly? Because those two go hand in hand. You can't be yep. servant, civic servant, if you don't have some mm -hmm. component of yourself in it. Yeah. Basically. Well, you know, my husband always says with his army career, he always says, do you always look out for number one? No one else is going to. And that was hard for me to adopt but I've adopted it in the years. Can you explain that for me? He, he always says, you know, from the standpoint of with my business, he sees how I always have to be on. I always have to be working with the public. And that's one of the hardest jobs ever. You know that. But he also says you need to look out for yourself because I'm always wanting to make sure that that person's taking care of, that person's taking care of, that person's taking care of. But what about you? And he says, you need to take care of yourself first before you can help anybody else. And always remember, you need to have your back covered because nobody else is going to, especially in the work that we do. So that's my selfish mode, which I've taken more seriously at the ripe age of 47. And, you know, I just turned 47 and I said, oh, wow. Huh, yeah. No is a great word. And that's my selfish mode saying no not compromising for other people. Yeah. What's your selfless one? Selfless is just continuing to be able to advocate for our veterans, advocating for those in the public square who are constantly being censored. The culture is on a spiritual attack and wanting to be able to advocate. I have so many people come over to my radio show, Cheryl Atkinson, Kathy Lee Gifford, Demi Tebow. And they've all said to me, don't stop. Thank you. Don't stop doing this. We need this. Thank you. And that's what I want to advocate for, to lift the good, the true, and the beautiful, to make sure families are back around the kitchen table, actually praying together, not with their phones, but talking, advocating for that. Because that's what founded this nation. It is. And you know, I have to ask one more question because I forgot it. I, I'm sorry, but I have to ask. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, is, um, what are your rules for becoming better at business relationships? How do you become the person people want to do relationship with this? Because there is a business relationship. How do you educate yourself on that? And, and, I, and I have not really known how to teach what I learned in DC and then right. working on in the entertainment industry for Sony, but like, how do you, how, what do you have like three points or I I would say it's it's cultivating relationships. I mean, in the days of grabbing coffee on the hill and cultivating those relationships, that's so key. And in this time period, people don't even people are too busy to even have coffee. But what I've found is setting aside time with people to cultivate those relationships, whether it's checking it on a reporter that I've that I've bonded with, or whether it is checking in on a client or a former client who I still believe in and I want to help. It's that cultivating piece. I think we forget about that and the harvest 
what comes after that is that harvest. And I've also found with knowing your bandwidth and knowing how much you can take on versus how much you want to take on. And I'm thankful that so many people come to me, I'm referred, et cetera, et cetera. It's an honor to do that. But I also don't want a quantity. I want a quality of work. And there's a difference there too, to make sure that you are not running around yourself ragged. It goes back to that filling the cup, having a clear mind and being able to serve, but being able to know that the quality versus the quantity. And I always say to my clients, I'm not going to go through and check a box just to check a box. I'm not a desk writer here. I'm not a government worker. I'm not just collecting a paycheck. All of people come to, come to me, they've come to me in the past couple of months. Hey, can you represent me? No, I can't. I'm not going to right now. We're in the heat of an election season and you are not going to be covered. I am not taking your money just to take your money and check a box. So having that integrity piece is a big deal too. So the cultivating of the relationships, even if you can't grab coffee, do a text check-in or do a virtual check-in, even if it's just five minutes, just grabbing that time with that person that you are building a relationship with, not just for another clickbait or another news report, but truly you care about that person and you get to, and in that business side of it, you get to know the backstory of some of these people that you're working with. Do they have kids? Did they serve? They lost a parent just recently. Those things matter. And it goes back to, we're not just a machine here. We're not AI, but we all have a heart and a soul and we still matter. And I think people need to feel that. And I don't think people feel that. Right. And that's our role right now. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Even <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on. I think you really, I think you are probably one of the top people I've observed through the years that really know the finesse of relationships. And that's why I really wanted you on because I had Eric before. He kind of knows the finesse of campaigning, getting things out and creating yeah. that magic moment. But we were part of him creating some of those magic moments around him. Yeah. And yeah. At the same time, I always really loved the way and seeing you as someone that is the ninja of relationships <laughs> ninja i love it i'll have to add that to my portfolio you're the ninja of the, no seriously i was just like wow who do i bring in to really talk about the finesse of relationship while well, it has to be eaten so oh, I knew, and you um you did it i i think a lot of people are going to learn a lot from this so i really thank you so much for this absolutely it's an honor to be here i'm so proud of you too so right back at you thanks for being a part of the pit crew <laughs> thank you bye-bye Bye. Thank you for listening to Become Famous Podcast. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, rate, and review our show. Your support helps us keep bringing you valuable insights on achieving fame in your industry. Keep shining and see you next time.